It was 15 years ago, and I know that Warren has already talked about this, but it was 15 years ago that we were having a, an NCFM LA meeting in, at, in, at the Dockside Grill in Marina Del Rey, and this man walked in and asked for me, and he sat down, apparently he had, he had come several hours just to m meet us, the NCFM LA chapter, and when we started talking about uh, him joining, the first thing he said is, I'm not a joiner. Well, today he's our president, and it's Harry Crouch. <laughs> that non-joiner uh, is not only our president now, but the most transformational president we've, I think, ever had. And that's not to put down any of the other presidents. Um, you know. Fair enough. Oh no, I'm sorry, sorry. Uh, you, you still owe me that, Harry, I know. We'll talk after tonight. But, um, you know, we, Tom Williamson carried the organization for, I think, over 10 years when it might have otherwise gone belly up when there was not uh, sort of a, a, a minimal amount of activism. And, and so we're very thankful to him for that. He was very good. But Harry came into this with such vision. He's always thought big. And this whole idea of this conference, what we otherwise would have just had a face-to-face -face board meeting, and he wanted this to be a conference for the 40-year anniversary, and he put so much work into this that I just want to thank him again a second time, as Warren did have us give him a hand even though he has stepped outside. Oh no, he's coming back. In. Anyway, thank you, Harry, and thank all of you for being here. I mean that, really. This is extraordinary. Um, I, what I want to talk about really is I'll be very brief about how I got into NCFM and then I want to, you know, we've done so many things that, and, and I want to focus on legal things since I'm an attorney and that's the kind of things I've done. And there's one particular lawsuit that I'm going to focus on especially on because not only did that make some significant changes, but I think it can be a prototype for things we can do in the future, which we're working on now as we put together a legal team. I got involved with NCFM way back in, I think, 1998 as a law student at UCLA when my best friend was being repeatedly abused physically by his wife. They both are drunks. Well, I'm, they're both uh, functioning alcoholics. Um, um, but he is a happy drunk who sings songs and gets annoying when she otherwise becomes violent. And I don't know what exactly it is, but it, I've seen it, and it's in, insane. She breaks things, she punches him, she's tried to stab him, she'll hit him in his sleep. Um, and there are kids involved. And these kids call me Uncle Mark. So I was always kind of concerned about them in particular. And while I was a law student, he would call me when this was happening because he sometimes needed me to go get him out of the house. And I started getting tired of it and thinking he needed help. So I started calling shelters, calling hotlines one night, and, and I called all over, and that's when I found nobody would take him. None of them would take him because he, he's a male. And except one, there was one shelter way out in Lancaster, California, about an hour north, called Valley Oasis. And uh, I had to wonder why that is. I mean, that was way too far. He wasn't, by the time I even learned about that, it was too late. He wasn't going to go out there. Um, but I had to start, I wanted to know why that was, so I started researching it. And that's when I came across this woman, Patricia Overberg, who passed away a few years ago. She was the former director at that time. There was a current director who had told me some things. But what I learned, the person who had actually created the policy there of taking men was Patricia. And what happened was in the 80s, she was getting male victims from all over the place. Um, and they had nowhere to go, nowhere. And some of them had kids with them. And uh, shelters even had an, uh, another policy of not allowing kids if the, it was a male over 12 years old. So it was a double problem for a lot of these guys if they had kids. And they needed counseling, they needed legal services, they needed to be an environment that was set up for that kind of victimization. And um, so she decided, okay, we have 11 houses. They're all within this big lot area. I'm gonna set aside one of them for men. And she did. And she retrained her staff. 
she set aside one for men, and she has never had a problem doing that, except one thing. Other shelters, and particularly three or four of them that were the most vicious, started mistreating her within the county at the county domestic violence conference meetings. You know, they network a lot. They have all these committees and conferences. And they were furious at her for doing that. They, were, they would mistreat her. They would uh, ostracize her. When she would speak up about the need to help male victims, they would refuse to put her comments in the minutes. It got so bad that she had to write a, uh, send a report to the LA County supervisors, and I don't think anything was ever done. Um, so I contacted her and started learning more and more ab about this. And um, she became like a, a, our Erin Pizzi of LA. I'm sure most of you know who Erin Pizzi is. She was our version of Erin of Pizzi. And what she told me was, because I was a law student, Mark, we need a civil rights lawsuit. And that's the only thing that's going to fix this. Um, and I always remembered that. So after law school, just to make a long story short, I founded the LA chapter of NCFM. Around that same time, Deborah Watkins was forming the Dallas-Fort Worth chapter of NCFM. And we, f we had a group of about 15, we grew to about 30, and we did so many things that I couldn't even go into it. I, mean, I was the president for 10 years. We held all kinds of rallies. I have some pictures of them here. We worked with lots of paternity fraud victims um, because there just happened to have been a state legislator at the time named Roderick Wright, who represented South Central, who had lots of these guys coming to him saying, you know, I'm stuck. I have a paternity judgment against me. The DNA excludes me as the dad, and the, I'm, the judge is still forcing me to pay. In some cases, they may have helped raise the child for a while. In others, they'd never even seen the child, never, never even heard of the child. And they were hit by default. And maybe either were never served or for other reasons didn't answer. One of them was deployed overseas when, when all this happened. He came back and learned he had, uh, uh, he owed fifteen or $20,000 in child support that he, for a child that was not his. That was Taryn James. This was a rally we did at Verizon because they were making these really horrible anti-father ads, and they had a history of it. We were successful in helping get that ad pulled, partly because of this rally. Um, this was our, one of our paternity fraud rallies, and that guy on the right was the guy who was deployed in, in the Gulf War um, as a military photographer and came back with this huge judgment. Everyone agreed the child wasn't his, but they were still forcing him to, to pay. He had a fiance he couldn't marry because of that. And when he became unemployed, they took his unemployment as well. Um, we're lucky he didn't become homeless. So this is the, I mean, we fought on, in the area of paternity fraud, we fought for years, and we actually did change the law. To ex we, it was a huge battle. And um, now and other groups were there to fight us. Believe me, when they say they're not fighting us on these things, it's a lie. They fought us tooth and nail. We were able to extend the deadline for men to challenge paternity based on DNA from six months to two years. We wanted longer, but we, we had to reach that compromise at one point or we could have been shattered. We were completely outgunned in the state legislature uh, in terms of funding, lobbying power, and of course, just politics in general. So we, that, but that change in the law helped tens of thousands of falsely, uh, of men who were stuck in paternity judgments get off the hook. There are still are more, it's not over. The battle is still there. I'm, I'm about to take on a, a, a pro bono paternity fraud case now for a guy up uh, down here in San Diego actually on behalf of NCFM. But it's nothing like what it was where we had th so many of these men just lining up at the, le at the state legislature with these horrible stories um, with DNA to prove they weren't the father. Um, we, uh, I won't go into the paternity fraud issue. We did hundreds of lawsuits against you know, institutions that discriminated against men, like patting down only the men, but not the women when they entered, or charging more for, me, for men, or things like that. We, had, uh, we, we forced certain local cities to change their policies. 
um, like if they were about to, they're only offering self-defense classes for women but not men. We got the city of Glendale to change that. We did so many things I couldn't even describe it, plus giving a lot of moral support to, to lots and lots of men. We had meetings, support groups, and things like that. Um, and several of you are here today. Joe Miranda just walked in, a very key part of the LA chapter. Um, but the thing that, that I probably will go to my deathbed with that I want to talk about is the lawsuit that we did that Patricia Overberg told me we needed, which was that civil rights lawsuit. Um, eventually, I started researching, and that's where I found, of course, the statistics, this is also cited, I believe, in the red pill from the Centers for Disease Control. Uh, for a long time, we didn't have any federal statistics on male victims except for ones from the Department of Justice, and that's the one the feminist groups love to cite, of course, because that's a crime-based survey. So when they do the survey, they do it in, in language, I don't mean police reports, it's actually a randomized survey, but it's done in the context of crime. So the questions they ask are things like, you know, have you ever been a victim of crime? Which ones? And they use terms like assault and crime-based language that makes um, men much less likely to respond positively even if they were a victim because they're, they have not been conditioned and taught to see it as a crime. And so that's what the, the statistics you usually hear from them are crime surveys. Look at the source that you'll say U, uh, U.S. Department of Justice, always something, something justice. That's why they're citing those sources. Eventually, um, and we know about the Febert bibliography and a lot of the private research that didn't use crime-based language that found men and women are initiating the violence at equal rates. And they would respond by saying, well, we should stick with the federal stats. Well, now we have a federal stat from the Centers for Disease Control that found pretty close to equal in terms of um, initiating the violence. And it's really hard for them to dispute that. There may be differences in terms of physical damage, but we know lots of men are being physically injured as well. We also know there's same-sex violence, and we also know that children are the biggest victims at all, regardless of the level of injury. My friend never, as far as I know, was never seriously physically injured by her, except once when she rebroke his leg um, that was in a cast. But other than that, most of her violence, he was never physically injured, but, these, but he was emotionally injured, and he was scared, and these children that are watching it, we know they're injured. We know they become part of the cycle. That becomes their model. And that was what was concerning me the most, these kids um, in his case. So we, res we researched the statistics. We talked to all kinds of people um, who were advocates. We, um, and while I was a law student, before I even finished, I, I talked to people from all over within, within NCFM and elsewhere starting to set up this lawsuit. We tried the lawsuit, I'm gonna skip this slide, I don't really have time to go into it, but for those who don't know, Professor Martin Fiebert of Cal State Long Beach has a bibliography on his website of hundreds of, of studies showing the equal numbers of, of violence between men and women in, in domestic violence circumstances. Um, I'm gonna Go back a minute before I go to that slide. We also started researching the law. We started going to the LA County Domestic Violence Council meetings and trying to change things with them and we faced nothing but hostility when we talked about male victims and the need to address them. Um, it was, it, we, we could see what Patricia Overberg was facing. Um, so we started researching the law to find what's the source of this? What do we need to attack if we're gonna have a civil rights lawsuit? And we found a lot of things, but ultimately what we found was a health and safety code in California, which is the one on the left. That's the California uh, code that was very gender specific. Okay, woman, female, woman, female. This was the code that provided millions of dollars every year for domestic violence services and funding for, uh, and shelters all over the state, about 22 or 24 million dollars a year, maybe more now, I don't know. But this is how it defined domestic violence for the purposes of those services. We found that the New York statute, there may be others, but the New York statute was gender neutral. So I used this slide as a comparison in the lawsuit to show it doesn't have to be this way. There are other states who've done it otherwise. 
Um, and we realize that's what we need to do is challenge that statute. When a statute discriminates on the face, on its face, you have a much easier time demonstrating discrimination than you do if it doesn't. For example, our custody laws are gender neutral. So in order to prove discrimination, we need to go into a lot of other things, statistics and things like that, which is much harder to prove. But when it's on its face like that, uh, there's not a lot, you don't even have to necessarily prove it's being implemented this way, but it was. You just need to show that and you can make a challenge under equal protection grounds. So we, ha we had to decide, do we want to file this lawsuit in federal court or state courts? Um, well, the federal equal protection clause, this is what it says, no state nor shall any state deprive any person, it says person, not group, of life, liberty, or property without due process. That's in the 14th Amendment. It prevents states from discriminating. The Fifth Amendment only applies to the federal government, so that wouldn't be the amendment that we would be using if we f took this to federal court. Um, the California Equal Protection Clause is very much the same. We didn't find much difference there. Uh, and in general, federal courts are, I would say, more objective, especially if you have local politics to deal with. In California, in general, I would rather it be in federal court than state court. But there was a reason why we took it to state court. First of all, I want to talk a little bit about federal equal protection analysis, how it works. The Equal Protection Clause, which I think is going to be a very important um, part of our movement as we start filing more lawsuits. Already we've had successes using it. Um, it. For a long time, historically, it sat dormant and wasn't really used much until the Civil Rights Movement came along and started using it to challenge things like um, the right of minorities to sit on juries or the right to vote, things like that, segregation. Then it developed. But over time, there were lots of other grounds challenges that weren't just based on race. So all kinds of things came up, gender and other things. And it became difficult for the courts to, to decide all of them because some of these things they cared about much more than others. For example, if you sued because you're um, 16, year old, 16 years old and you can't vote and can't drink alcohol, isn't that treating people differently? How, you know, do we care about that? How do you differentiate some of these things that we want to keep from the ones we don't. And this is what the, the courts develop. And this is about two weeks of law school, school summed up in probably two minutes. But over time, case after case after case, they develop this analysis where there's three different levels of analysis. If, if a law discriminates um, based on a certain uh, classification, you would have to ask, in order for it to be constitutional, you have to ask a certain question. That's what we mean by scrutiny. And it would be one of these three questions depending on what it is. So for race, it was given strict scrutiny, the strictest of all. And the question was, does the classification, is it narrowly tailored to a compelling government interest? So narrowly tailored, that's pretty strong language. It has to be really carefully, narrowly, narrowly tailored to that interest. And there has to be a compelling government interest. So an example where race-based discrimination did pass strict scrutiny was in a prison riot where there was a race-based prison riot and they had to separate the races because there seemed to be no other way to stop it. But otherwise, it's very hard to pass strict scrutiny. Gender, on the other hand, or sex, um, was given intermediate scrutiny. Heightened, not just the basic one, but still not the top. And the language was it, the classification has to be carefully tailored to an important government interest. Okay, so it's, that kind of gives the courts a little leeway there and it scared us. It's, it scared us a little because we know what the climate's like out there. We know how biased the judges can be. And we knew what we were up against. And then the lowest level is rational basis. If it's not a, a discrimination that's listed by the courts to fit in one of these two, then the question is just, is there any rational basis for this form of discrimination? And if there is, it passes. But we don't have to worry about that. We were concerned about this. 
What we also found, though, and this is why we stayed in California courts, was that in California, it, gender is given strict scrutiny instead of intermediate scrutiny. And so with that, we had a huge advantage in the California courts. And we started researching the different uh, decisions in different appellate districts, and we, we chose Sacramento to file it. We, we, took, we tried numerous ways to file this lawsuit that initially failed. We tried civil rights testers who didn't really need services but were calling to test. The, the programs, and so uh, that didn't work for various reasons. Um, but what, what finally worked was having sympathetic plaintiffs who really needed the services. We got four men throughout California. One of them was in a wheelchair, um, and another one committed suicide while the lawsuit was pending, unfortunately. Um, but we took four of them, and the daughter of one of them, because she had tried to get her father's services, from a group called Weave in Sacramento, which is, it actually gets about $4 million a year, half of it from public funds. And we sued, uh, we sued the state. And this one got media attention, and suddenly the climate was a little different because they couldn't put down these plaintiffs uh, so easily as if they were just civil rights testers. Um, so we filed it in California. The case, this is David Woods. He was the main plaintiff. Uh, who lived in Sacramento, and his wife admitted, admitted on television when, this, when, the, when the media interviewed her, yeah, I slap, I hit, and he never hit back. He was, he was a former bouncer from, from Houston who was really tough. He felt if he hit her, he could have killed her. Um, but he was, she was constantly attacking him, and one time or a few times he needed help, and we've said, no, we don't provide services to men. So, we filed the lawsuit, we went through about two years of a battle at the lower court. And while it was pending, something interesting happened. I know some of you know about this already. I have spoken about this at another conference in Australia. But while the lawsuit was pending, a gay rights group called Equality California um, introduced a bill that would have made that statute gender neutral. And if you read the legislative history, it's be, the reasoning was that men are being denied services, domestic violence services and, and, and shelter. But when they did that, the shelter programs uh, were angry and wrote letters to the state legislative committee and demanded that it be changed back. And they put pressure on that group to change that part of the bill. They, the bill had a lot of other things, but they wanted that put back and the org, that group folded and changed it back. Um, and I, I, you know, I had mixed feelings about it because on the one hand I was glad they were doing this and on the other hand I wanted an appellate victory in this case, uh, I guess selfish reasons, but I also think it helps the movement a lot to have an appellate victory that affects the entire state um, and could affect people beyond the state and gets the, into the media and actually declares that it's unconstitutional to do this rather than just changing it legislatively. Uh, a court victory that says this is unconstitutional is an is a even bigger victory, I think, for men's rights. So I had some conflicting feelings about it, but once they changed it back, it didn't matter anymore. We needed to proceed with the lawsuit. The judge was actually sympathetic to us and said, I have had battered men in my courtroom. But he also expressed fear that if he found that statute unconstitutional, he would have to invalidate the entire thing and all the funding would end. And I knew that was gonna be his fear. I knew that would be the fear of any judge up there, especially for political reasons. I explained to him though, that there's an alternative that's called judicial reformation. And judicial reformation is a concept where if a judge finds a statute unconstitutional, but also finds that based on the, history, the legislative history, if they feel that simply reforming the statute to be constitutional and leaving the rest intact would be more in line with what the legislature would have wanted, then they can do it. But there are certain strict criteria that has to be met in order for them to do it, but they can do it. And I explained that to them, and he seemed to just not listen at all. His concern seemed to be only if he invalidates it, this will happen. So 
actually, to my surprise, he went against, the, he said, I thought we were going to win that one. And I'll never forget the day I read the decision where he went against us and found it's not unconstitutional. The discrimination is okay because women are not similarly situated with men because there are more women who need the services. A completely illogical conclusion because the Equal Protection Clause protects individuals. Remember, it said no person. It does not say no group. And you can't just say, well, if you're in the minority, then it's okay to discriminate against you. That's not how equal protection works. It makes no sense. Even if there was one male victim, we still were, are to protect him. It's kind of like occupational deaths, 94% men. Well, would that, be, would that justify us denying services to women who, who, are, who are injured on the job just because 90-something percent of them are men? It's ridiculous. Um, so I appealed it the next day. I was furious. I'll never forget how I felt. Uh, and the, the, the appeal dragged on for about a year or more. But ultimately, and I have argued it before three judges, um, and I'll never forget that day. But it ultimately, we won. And it's, it was, they unanimously, the three judges unanimously reversed it and held that that is unconstitutional. And one of those three judges is now the Supreme Court Justice, Chief Justice of California. She's a Filipino woman, I can't remember her name. If any of you remember it, it's Cantil something. It's a difficult name to pronounce. But uh, I'm really happy that she's up there now. And I think we need more lawsuits um, because she's, she's somebody that I think we can rely on, actually, um, for when we, when we get to the Supreme Court, I think. And we will on some of these more additional lawsuits that we're going to be filing. Um, some of the language in the decision was not as strong as I would like, but we got some good things that can be quoted. It is a published decision. And these can be binding in California and can be cited throughout the nation even though they're not, even if it's a state outside California, it can be cited for pers what we call persuasive authority. Um, and so some of the language, domestic violence is a serious problem for both men and women. Men experience significant levels of domestic violence as victims. The discrimination carries with it the baggage of sexual stereotypes. Male victims are similarly situated with female victims for purposes of the statutory programs, and no compelling state interest justifies the gender discrimination. Woods versus Horton. Um, that is the only decision I know like that, honestly, in the world. Um, and it got media attention all over the world. I got calls from Scotland. They did an article on it there, and the reporter told me we have the same problem here. It was, in, it was written up in Canada and other places. There is one decision that's somewhat close to it in West Virginia. There's been a battle there. And they won it at the lower level, the opposite of us. The lower court judge found there's rampant sex discrimination against men in these services. But on appeal, it was overturned for jurisdictional reasons, because they found that the, I believe that there was no, that the, the, the plaintiffs didn't have standing. So I don't know what's going to happen next in West Virginia, but that's an, a state where we need a lawsuit like this. And I think we need them in a lot of other places, even if the statute is not gender specific. And even once you get rid of that, that's not the end of it. And, and the civil rights movement learned that decades ago. Just because you change the statute, there's still the implementation. And what we're learning, because we had a big meeting with LA County after this, what we're learning is that even though there has been some big changes, like Weave and Sacramento made some pretty big changes um, and started taking male victims, we're finding that some counties, and LA is one of them, are interpreting the language in, a, in kind of a sly way to avoid it. The, the case says that if, if the services do not have to be exactly identical, so, and the case law, the decision actually says, for example, if you can't mix the genders in a shelter, you can, uh, you can provide a hotel arrangement, okay? And that's actually an argument I made before them because I knew these judges were going to be afraid of that issue as well, and I needed to give them an alternative. And they wrote that in there. Well, that's fine. I think the issue of mixing the genders is a debatable one, especially because some of these shelters are huge and dormitory-like, and um, Patricia Overberg has never had a problem mixing them, but she doesn't mix them in the same house unless there's overflow. 
but she has told me she's never had a problem if there's overflow. She asks the consent of the victims, uh, uh, if they mind having a male victim because there's overflow or the reverse, and they've never had a problem with it. Regardless, I'll give the, the mixing issue, uh, I, I'll say it's debatable, but at least, at least hotel vouchers, at the bare minimum, and still providing legal services and counseling, they should at least be doing that. Well, the way LA County is interpreting that, they're saying, well, that was just one example, because it said, for example, another example would be if we just send them to Valley Oasis, send them out to the desert, send them in Lancaster, to Lancaster. Their interpretation of it is as long as we do that, we're complying with the Woods decision. So we need another lawsuit. And one of the reasons I'm, I wanted to speak here is to ask for your help. If you know anybody, if you have a male victim, or you have any evidence of discrimination taking place in California by uh, state funded, has to be government funded. I don't care where the funds, whether it's federal, state, county, city, it has to be government funded. But if they're government funded, and you know that they're discriminating against men, and you can sh demonstrate it, please let me know. Because we are preparing another lawsuit. It's in the works. And I think it's really badly needed. Um, another lawsuit that we have pending, as I mentioned earlier, is we're suing the, the, f the Selective Service right now under the Federal Equal Protection Clause. Because as you know, it has been announced by um, the Department of Defense that they're going to allow women in all combat roles. So the old reason that the Supreme Court gave back in 1991 for allowing the discrimination in the draft no longer exists. That reason was women aren't allowed in combat, so therefore men and women are not similarly situated. Well, that's going to change. So we have a lawsuit pending right now. Um, the lower court in LA threw it out, finding that it wasn't ripe, meaning it's premature because women have not yet been allowed in all combat roles, even if there's going to be. Um, but the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeal unanimously reversed it about three, four months ago. So the case has been revived, but unfortunately it's been transferred to Texas um, be, for various reasons that are kind of complicated. On the other hand, I'm not that disappointed because the Texas court so far has been more objective in their decision making than the LA judge has. I know generally, I think in the appellate courts, we probably would be better off in California. But at the lower court, we have a better judge there than here. So right now, I'm not that disappointed in it, and that case is proceeding. We have other lawsuits in the works. We're putting together a legal team. Uh, I finally quit my job recently, and I'm going on my own, although it's going to take a while to get settled. But um, I finally can start taking on things, and I'm working with uh, one or two other attorneys on putting together something for NCFM that would be a, a legal team of some kind, at least the start. It would be unfunded at first. If we can get funding, that would be great. But right now, it's going to be mostly volunteer, pro bono, and, and maybe paid a little bit here and there. But that's what we're doing. Um, there is, this is us outside the, that's Harry and the rest of us outside the, the Federal Court of Appeal where we won the reversal. Some of you are here, of course, Harry, Al Rava, another attorney, and uh, I know Stephen Carroll's there in the back. Um, but it's exciting to me because I've wanted to do this for a really long time. I d I've done workers' compensation the past six years, and I I've enjoyed it, but I was overloaded, and it's not my dream. I teach family law at night in a paralegal program, and I enjoy that. And I can get interns who work for free sometimes. Um, they get school credit for it. So we're setting it up. And uh, if anyone has thoughts or ideas, especially if you can give me evidence of that discrimination going on or thoughts of other lawsuits, other types of equal protection challenges, because that's what I'm most interested in. They can be federal as well, or they can be just a city that's discriminating somewhere. Let me know, okay? Th I'm very interested in knowing.